Anybody like to tell me what they can see? Two beautiful children, thank you. It's not a trick question, by the way. <laughs> this is the cream of Woodside, isn't it? Oh, that was the other performance briefing, was it? Happiness. Thank you, Armin. Anything else? There's no right or wrong answer as well. Care. Care? Love. Love? Yeah. Protection. Sorry? Protection. Protection? Innocence. Innocence? Yeah. Anything else? Happy. Happy future. Yeah. I see all those things, and, and I see a heck of a lot more. Uh, it's difficult for me to really sort of look at that photograph without uh, getting a certain sense of uh, stability, but also to, to feel something in the pit of my stomach and, and the voice starts to waver a little bit because, uh, surprise, surprise, that's my children. Uh, the little girl is Eloise Catherine. She was born the 26th of August, 1997. And the little guy is uh, my son, Alexander John Patrick, and he was born the 5th of January, 2000. Uh, not to worry, that's not one of mine. <laughs> she, doesn't, she isn't in need of any urgent medical attention. That, that, that's Lucy the doll. Uh, I see all those things. I see innocence. I see happiness. But perhaps more than, than anything, I see the future. Uh, because the, the future are in my children's hands as the future is in your children's hands. And I have a role to play. I, I have a big role to play. I don't know what their life's going to hold for them. They're age four and two. Uh, they maybe go on to, to work for one of Roy Thompson's project teams and, and be good uh, community citizens and, and do the right thing by their fellow man, but life may hold something different for them. Who's to say my little girl won't be the person who finds a cure for cancer or AIDS? Who's to say my son won't be the first president of Australia? Not I. They're four and two. But my role, I think, is a very important one, and it's to try and provide them with the kind of environment where they can grow up and be exactly the kind of people that they are destined to be, that they can fulfill whatever aspirations, aspirations in life they have. So it's important, I feel, that I'm around to provide them with that loving, nurturing environment and to provide them with that, that stability uh, so they can achieve what life holds for them. That's the altruistic view. But there's something very selfish in my view as well, that they make me a much better person. They teach me things about being a dad, about being a human being, about being a child, about the world, about love, about integrity, about trust. And every day they teach me something, and every day that they're in my life, I'm a better person because of it. They enrich the quality of my life, and I'm growing every day that they're with me. And I want to be around for that reason, because they complete me. They make me better. And I know that uh, through my parenthood and my association with them, I'm going to develop as a person. Thanks, Rod. I want to tell you a little story now. And it's a hypothetical story, but perhaps it's not as hypothetical as we would like to think it could be. I work for Woodside, and from time to time, I need to travel away. Before I travel away, I like to sit down with my kids the night before I go and explain to them that I'm going away for a couple of days. Because in the morning when they wake up, they like to jump into bed with my wife and I. We have a cuddle up. We talk about the day ahead and the day past. And I don't want them to be fearful in the morning when they come through and Dad's not there. So I sit down the night before and say, listen, Dad's got to go away for a couple of days, but uh, please be good kids for your mum. So the next morning arrives, I awake about 5 a.m., I head to the airport, I get on board the Qantas flight heading to Caratha, get on a helicopter and head out to Goodwin. Why am I going out to Goodwin? I'm going out to Goodwin to attend their Platform Health and Safety Committee meeting, but also they've asked me to do an audit of their permit to work system. I attend the meeting and I start the audit. The day's progressing and it's about 4.30 in the afternoon. The afternoon helicopter comes into land, passengers alight, more passengers get on. The helicopter starts to leave the uh, heli deck. The pilot notices a fault indication light in the cockpit. It's 
not exactly sure what the problem is. He hopes it's just an instrumentation problem, but he's concerned that it may be something more serious. So rather than take off, he decides to hover about a metre above the heli deck and try and work out what the problem is. As he's hovering there, the downdraft from the helicopter is acting on a box. The box weighs about seven kilos and it's sitting in the lee of the heli deck. The box contains a light fitting. It's there because the following day it's going to be fitted to the heli deck structure. And it's been located there until it's uh, time to, to fit the box. About the same time, I need to go and check one last permit as part of the audit I'm doing. I start to leave the accommodation module. As I start to leave the accommodation module, the downdraft from the helicopter picks up the box, throws it over the handrail, and it drops 30 meters. Hits me on the head. It fractures my skull, breaks my neck. I'm killed instantly. As is required, the platform emergency response team is mobilized, and because there's been a fatality, the WA police service are notified. It's about 6.30 in the evening. My kids, they've had their dinner, they've had their bath, they're in their pyjamas, and the front doorbell goes. They're excited. Maybe Dad's come home early. Maybe a friend's come around to play. So they rush down to the front door, but it's not Dad. It's not a friend. It's a female police officer on the Woodside Pier supporter. My wife, Trish, walks down the hallway. She sees the uniform. Her mind starts to race. I wonder what's happened. Perhaps there's been a car accident in the street. Perhaps one of the neighbours has been broken into. She greets the visitors and they go into the lounge room. The police officer starts talking. Mrs. Sim is concerning your husband, Alan. I've got some bad news. It's the very, very worst news. What's the very, very worst news you can give somebody? The tears start to flow. The police officer continues. I'm sorry to inform you your husband, Alan, was killed in an accident offshore two hours ago. My sincere condolences. Tears, uncontrollable tears. That feeling of sick in the pit of your stomach that wasn't there a minute ago, but it's there now. Those young, happy faces, they're no longer happy. What are they thinking? They're confused. Who are these people? Who are these strangers sitting in my lounge room? Why are they making my mummy so upset? I want my daddy. They start to scream, I want my daddy. Because in the middle of the night, when they had a nightmare and woke up, I was there for them. I went in, I picked them up, I scared the monsters away, and I told them everything was going to be okay. And it was. When they fell and injured themselves, I picked them up, I dusted them down, I kissed the wound better, and I sent them on their way. And when their young emotions threatened to overwhelm them, I held them close. I put their head on my shoulder, and they fell asleep in my arms. But I'm not there, and I'm not coming back ever again. It's brutal, and it's violent. There's no visitations to the hospital. There's no sitting down with the children, talking to them, getting them to come to terms with the fact that one day, Daddy's going to go to heaven to be with Granny and Granddad. I'm just not coming back ever again. And what do I miss out on? First day at school, first day at senior school, first boyfriend, first girlfriend, first wild love affair, first hangover, first time you smoke a joint, first day at university, graduation, first day in the workforce, marriage, grandchildren. I miss out on everything, everything. And why? The bereaved, the grieving, they always need to know why. They need answers. They need to get to closure. Because somebody thought it would be okay. Somebody thought that box would be okay. Tell my fatherless children. Tell the parents who grieve for a lost son. Tell the wife that's had to bury a husband. And why do I tell you this? Because the responsibility you bear me, I bear you. For it wasn't me that was killed in that accident. 
it was you that was killed in that accident. And it wasn't you that saw that box and did nothing about it. It was me. Because that day when I arrived on Goodwin, when I walked down from the heli deck, I saw that box there. And I saw it wasn't secure. And for one fleeting moment, I thought, I should do something about that. I should tell somebody. But I didn't. I walked past. Why didn't I do something about it? Why didn't I tell somebody? Why didn't I secure that box? Because I didn't have the courage to do it. I didn't have the courage to report it. I didn't have the courage to secure that box. So now I ask myself, do I have the courage to look your children in the eye? Do I have the courage to look your wife, your husband in the eye? Do I have the courage to look your parents in the eye? And every day thereafter, when I wake up in the morning, would I have the courage to look myself in the eye? Because if I don't have that courage, then I better have the courage to do something about that damn box. The incident details I described actually occurred on Goodwin around September 2000. Thank you.